Hi, I'm Melanie, and you're about to watch a message that was preached here at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help you take your next step in your relationship with God, and we pray that this message helps you do just that. How's everybody doing? Well, we are glad that you're here. We are glad to be back. My wife and I were at the couples retreat uh, last week, and uh, for those of you that have never been, you should really go. And those of you that are not married, you should figure that out between now and next year. You have time. Between now and next year, all you have to do is meet someone, fall in love, propose, plan a wedding, say for a wedding, have a wedding, go on a honeymoon, sign up for the retreat, and drive there. That's it. That's all you got to do. And, uh, and th then you're, and you're set. So, um, and the cool thing about the retreat is that I've been to couples retreats before where it was like session after session after session about marriage. And it's like, I didn't have any opportunity to actually be married while I was on the retreat. And so we try not to do that. We do a session on Friday night and then we do two sessions Saturday morning and then, um, a session on Sunday morning before we, we close. But other than that, we try to give couples a lot of free time because we know that for a lot of couples, they don't get a lot of time like apart from their kids and just kind of focusing on their relationship. And uh, so Saturday night is usually when we have like, you know, date night, all the couples go out and hit the town in Naples, which as you can imagine, it's as exciting as it sounds. Uh, you know, the nightlife in Naples is legendary as you know, you know that, you know that. But... <laughs> So, some people are just getting that. Like, is he serious? Like, no, I'm not. I'm not serious at all. That, that's, that's, that's sarcasm. And, uh, but what happens is, is that the last couple of years, we've gone uh, to dinner um, to my favorite restaurant, uh, which is down the street from the hotel uh, where we usually do the retreat. And uh, so my favorite restaurant is Fleming's, by the way, which is a steakhouse. And I say that because I have a birthday coming up. And um, so uh, now my wife is not a big... Uh, fan of steak, but she just usually kind of humors me and goes, well, anyway, this time I said, you know, uh, let me not go to my place that she likes. Let me go to a place that she likes. And so I made a reservation at a different restaurant uh, called Seasons 52, if you have ever been there, um, which is fine. I just encourage men to eat before they go <laughs> so that when they leave, they feel full. And uh, so we get there, we get there, and um, it, it's, it's, it, it, I just got to tell you, it's slim pickings as far as menu items for me. And uh, I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, I'm like all for eating healthy, but this is like taking it to like a real extreme here. So I decide I'm going to get these artichoke, grilled artichokes. So it's pretty good. And they're like, no, we, c we don't have any artichokes because of the fires in California, which I was kind of sad about the fires in California before I learned about this, but now it became a personal problem. And I'm like, I can't have my dinner because of a fire. Anyway, so now I'm like, this injustice. Anyway, so, um, so then my wife, she's looking at me. She goes, you know what? Uh, I'm going to order a steak. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? No. Why are we even here? What's the point of this entire exercise? And then I realize I'm on a date with my wife. And I'm like, I mean, I love you so much. Um, get whatever your heart desires. Um, so anyway, the sir, I got nothing. I mean, nothing. And so she's like, will you trust me? And, and I don't know why we trust servers. I really don't. It's like, hey, I've known you for 45 seconds. Could you order for me? Um, so anyway, which I did. I tried, trust, she's like, trust me, I'm going to bring you. I love this. I eat this every time. I so my wife gets a steak and I get um, what gets delivered to me is a roasted cauliflower um, which, friends, um, it sounds better than what it even was. Um, because when I got it, it was not even chopped up. It was just a giant head of cauliflower with Parmesan and like a cheddar type cheese. I don't even know. They, were like, they gave it some fancy name, but it basically is like a ch yeah, cheddar cheese. And, and you want to know what? No amount of cheese can mask the taste of death that comes with eating a cauliflower. Um, and, and by the way, the thing looked like a human brain, and it was the size of a volleyball, which it operated like a volleyball when I spiked it and hit it right back at her. 
I didn't do that, but I wanted to. And, um, and you know, the, thing, the real kicker for me was that we, we're eating this meal, and my wife is eating this steak, and, I, and, and they put me in this kind of the corner of the restaurant, and there's a window, and I'm eating this cauliflower, you know, and I'm looking out the window, and I can see Flemings across the street. <laughs> I mean, horrible. Hor- and I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that in your life where you've done the right thing and expecting things to go well, but it didn't go well, and now you've got to kind of ha- try to muster up every bit of, like, good attitude that you have during it. And sometimes it's funny like this, and then other times it's, it's not funny because there have been moments where you've trusted someone um, and, and, and only to see them um, stab you in the back. Uh, There have been moments where you've loved someone only to be betrayed by them. There have been moments where you've uh, really sought to help someone. You know, you were there for them in their hour of need, but now your moment came and they were nowhere to be found. And, um, And listen, these are defining moments in our lives. These are moments that truly move the needle as to what kind of person we're going to be and what kind of person we're going to become. And that's why Jesus, when he talks to his disciples and these this crowd of followers that are following him around, He's going to talk to them about what it means to be human. That's the part of this conversation. And Jesus, as he begins this sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, he's going to talk to them about, well, what, is, what, what does it mean to be happy? But what we think about being happy is happiness is controlling all of my outside circumstances so everything is working according to my plan. But Jesus is going to tell us something very different, that happiness is not that. It's not me controlling all the outside circumstances. It's me controlling what's happening internally despite the outside circumstances. And listen, here's the thing that's so important for us is that if we can get this part right, that's what will set us apart from everyone else, from from a culture and a world that is far from God and doesn't know him. Listen, they aren't looking on. An unbelieving world is not looking on and saying, I wonder how the Christians do when everything goes their way. No, everybody's doing fine when everything goes their way. What they're looking on is, how are we going to do as believers when things aren't going our way? When we don't get the good bounce, when circumstances aren't good, how are we going to respond in those seasons? And if we can actually still experience happiness and joy despite circumstances, that's going to be the thing that God uses that transforms us. So I'm going to invite you to open with me to the Gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, I'd love for you to open there with me. If you have your Calvary app, I'd love for you to open uh, the app. If you have your notes, if you have it just written on a scrap piece of paper, I'd love for you to take it out. And uh, we're going to start in verse 7 in uh, Matthew 5, and here's what we read. He says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now if you pause there and give me your attention, what what is uh, Jesus talking about here. Here's what he's saying as far as people being happy, you and I being happy. He says, happy people don't carry grudges. They don't carry grudges. And he talks about mercy. He talks about how to be merciful. But before we talk about how to be merciful, let's talk about four things that mercy is not. Number one, if you're a note taker, mercy is not justifying another person's actions. It's not. When you forgive someone, you're not saying that what they did was okay. You're simply letting go of the baggage that could be holding you. And uh, because the the definition of mercy, by the way, is not getting what you deserve. And so when we show a person mercy, we're keeping them from getting uh, the thing that they deserve. It doesn't mean they didn't deserve the consequences of their actions. We just decided to forgive so that they didn't experience the consequences of their actions. So That's the first one. Mercy, number two, is not waiting on the passage of time. And I think that's, you know, whoever said, you know, time heals all wounds, that person is an idiot. Um, Because I have learned, and I bet you have learned the same thing, that many times the opposite is true. We all know people that the passage of time has only hardened them due to their unforgiveness. Time only helps when you've forgiven as the passage of time then lessens uh, the, the, the pain because you're just so far away from the blast radius of when the thing actually took place. But forgiveness has to take place for time to help at all. The third is this, is that mercy is not denying you are hurt. 
Listen, when you say, no, it's no big deal, man. I don't care. It's cool. Like you're, you're just, um, when, when, that, when you say that, when you're hurt, what takes place is now that starts getting under your skin and it's like a splinter that goes unattended. Um, and, and, and it just, it causes pain and infection and mercy is about deciding to forgive rather than exacting revenge. Forgiveness is about, hey, you hurt me, but I want you to know that, that I, I'm, I'm dealing with it and I, and I forgive you and I want to move on from it. The fourth is this, and this is huge, and that is that mercy is not automatically trusting again, or automatically trusting them again, I should say. Um, just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that you have to trust them. These are two separate things. Forgiveness is a choice that we make. Trust is something uh, that a person earns. We forgive freely, but a person earns trust through wise choices and wise actions. Now, this is important. And forgiveness is difficult because, listen, the way we're wired, we're not wired uh, to naturally forgive. I mean, that's just not, not the way that, that we're, we're made. We naturally, because of our fallen nature, uh, we naturally want to exact revenge. Someone hurts us, we want to make them feel the same way they made us feel. And most of us are like, I want to make you feel the way I felt, but like maybe add 20% to it. Um, and that's, and Jesus is going to deal with that later. Um, but here's the thing. He sa- Jesus says that the merciful are the ones who are blessed and the ones who are happiest. Why? Because the merciful are the ones who are reminded that they have been the recipients of mercy, the recipients of grace, the, the, the recipients of forgiveness. And do you know what that causes a person when you, um, when you forgive someone, someone's hurt you and you forgive them and then remember that you've been forgiven? It causes this amazing thing, gratitude. Paul would, the Apostle Paul would say, thinking about this, speaking of what Jesus is talking about, he says this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Here's my point. When, when you show mercy and compassion and forgive, it reveals something about us that we've experienced forgiveness. When we refuse to forgive, when we choose vengeance over mercy, it reveals that we've never experienced mercy. But, and by the way, even if you're like, yeah, but I never got forgiveness. But when you show forgiveness, when you didn't experience mercy and you give mercy, now you break the cycle. When I was nine, uh, I was living in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I was li- living in this little apartment with uh, my, my mom and my stepdad. And I was home from school. And uh, I went into the kitchen and I grabbed this um, open bag of Doritos. And I got to be honest with you, I, I didn't, it was not that I really wanted Doritos. Uh, I just wanted the nacho cheese flavoring that comes from Doritos. So I decided that I didn't want to eat the Doritos. So what I did was I would take the Doritos out and just lick all of the nacho cheese off. And so the thing is, is that now it has gone from a being a Dorito to becoming a Tostito. And, uh, and so I like, so then I would just, because they were still good, I would put them back in the bag. So I would, I went through all of them because, you know, you can't leave a job half done. So I went through the rest of the bag and ate all, licked all the cheese off and then put them back in. And then, um, I, I rolled the thing back up and put the clothes pin on it. We didn't have chip clips back then. This is back in the 1800s. So anyway, I put the clothes pin on and put, and put the Doritos away. About an hour later, I heard a scream and, um, my mom too wanted some Doritos, and what she got were these moist, wet, saliva-covered corn chips, and, uh, and so, and, and that was, and, and, and so, and I knew it was bad, because she walked into my room, and she had the Doritos in one hand, and a belt in the other, and, and that's when things got ugly, Um, and now, let me, let me fast forward, let me fast forward 28 years, and uh, now, I'm, I'm in my 30s, and uh, I go to the pantry. I grab a bag of Doritos. Some things haven't changed. Um, and I reach into the bag, and I take a bite. And it is all wet. The Dorito is all wet. And, I, and, and through my powers of deduction, I realize that it is my then three-year-old daughter, Mia, who too wanted nacho cheese but didn't want to chew the Dorito. And apparently this is like ingrained in my DNA. Uh, This is part of what I gave to her. And and so, 
And uh, so she got her hair from her mom and that little trick from me. Um, so what happens is, is that I get it and, and I realize that she has, she has licked all the cheese off the Doritos and put them back in the bag and now I am on the other side of this. And, um, and, and, and her and I just have this, first I told her it was totally disgusting, don't do that. And then we just laughed about it. And, and, and here's the key. You, you ever notice this? It's, it's so much easier to forgive when you're guilty of the same thing. You ever notice that, right? You ever cut somebody off on the road and, you're like, and, and, and then you're like, you know, it, it, I'm so sorry. And then somebody cuts you off and you're like, peace, my child. You know, <laughs> you ever do that? You know, you're like, it's okay. You know, you feel like you're, the, you're like in the Pope mobile and you're the Pope. You're like, it's okay, my child. It's fine. You have much to learn, you know. And so, and so but that's the whole thing that, that some of you are like, he drives a Pope mobile? Anyway, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I have so much more there, and I need to move. But uh, this is I, okay. Um, but that's the that's I got a I got a hard transition here. Um, but that's the key. Listen, when you are guilty of the same thing, it's easy to forgive. And I want to tell you something: that being a Christian, we enter the door of becoming a Christian, and the door that opens is is forgiveness and mercy and grace and love because we were messed up, we're sinners, we've fallen, we've made tons of mistakes, rebelled against God, and God welcomes us. Jesus died for us. He forgave us and, 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 and welcomes us into, um, as his child, and it begins at the place of mercy. It begins at the place of grace and forgiveness. And listen, if we can't be merciful, then we've missed it. And that's the thing that Jesus is saying. Like, we've got to realize this. And, and I want to tell you something. This, and I know that this sounds, like, us to talk about it is a lot easier than actually doing it. But I want to share something with you that I think has been, has been helpful for me. I think about this phrase a lot. And, uh, and, and I, so maybe you want to write it down or take a picture of it. But this is the thing. Whenever something happens, let me show you this. I've been forgiven of worse. And man, somebody, you did this to me, and I want to respond a certain way. And then I say, I've been forgiven of worse. And it helps me, helps us to be merciful. Because when we've experienced mercy, and we have, if you're a Christian, you've, been, you've experienced incredible mercy. You've experienced incredible grace, incredible forgiveness. You will find gratitude, and that gratitude is going to bring an incredible amount of joy in your life. Well, Jesus goes on in verse 8, and he says this, uh, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, if you pause there, uh, second thing that Jesus talks about, about what happy people do, happy people bring peace to chaos. They bring peace to chaos. Now, uh, the culture that Jesus was living in placed huge emphasis on outward uh, obedience. And the hope was is that you doing the right things externally would translate into um, inward devotion. But what happened was is that uh, through all of the basically lawyering that had happened with the Jewish, uh, the, the, the Jewish law, a lot of times what had happened is they had created all of these sub-laws around God's law. They, they would say that they were obeying the law by doing the exact opposite of what the spirit of the law actually was. And later in the Sermon on the Mount, we're actually going to spend a little more time dealing with that. But what Jesus then does is he kind of turns it on its head and he starts talking about the pure in heart. And what are the pure in heart? The pure in heart, uh, literally that, that phrase pure in heart refers to those uh, who have no impurities in their motives. They are clean, they're honest in, in their motives. And the blessing that they received is that they see God, which is a Jewish idea uh, that means that they will experience God. And the cool thing is this, and I want you to follow the train of thought here, where Jesus says, the pure in heart, those whose motives are pure, they're going to experience God in, in an amazing way. And then you know what they're going to do? They're going to walk into places where there's conflict. And when they make peace in moments when there's conflict, people are going to recognize that they're children of God because they've experienced God, and now they bring this uh, wisdom of God, peace of God, wherever they go. So... What, how can you and I be peacemakers? I want to talk about that for a minute. So let's talk about three ways we can be peacemakers. Number one is this, that peacemaking does not equal peacekeeping. Being a peacemaker, 
assumes that there is a conflict that needs to be resolved. And listen, couples, can I talk, talk to you about this? This is huge in relationships. Is that a lot of times there's this like unresolved conflict, unresolved tension. And a lot of times we don't want to do anything because we don't want to disturb the quote unquote peace. And, but that's not peace. Um, you're just trying to keep whatever lack of conflict there is, but lack of conflict doesn't mean uh, peace. Peacemakers confront conflict in love and seek to resolve it in wisdom and in a godly way. So Jesus isn't saying, um, you know, keep the peace no matter the cost. No, sometimes being a peacemaker is turning over tables in the temple. Sometimes being a peacemaker is telling the person, hey, those words that you're using are not acceptable when you speak to me. Sometimes it's war and conflict that are involved in being a peacemaker. And that's why Jesus is saying, listen, you're happy when you're a peacemaker because you're taking conflict and you're bringing real resolution and peace because you're solving it in a godly way. The second thing about being a peacemaker is to make sure that you're not the problem. Because there are things that we cannot control. You can't control other people's actions. You can't control what other people say. But you know what you can control? Your actions, what you say. And, and that's why, listen to what, Jesus, uh, what Paul says in Romans. He says this. He says, uh, if it is possible... As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Notice he says, if it's possible, and as much as depends on you. That means if there's a problem in the relationship, make sure you're not the problem. And if you are the problem, then you have the power to deal with the problem. So my wife and I in February, uh, in just a few months from now, we're going to be celebrating 22 years being married. And uh, well, thank you. Thank you. I feel like I just putted for eagle. Um, like, wow, that's very nice, very nice. <laughs> Let's move on. Anyway, so, but I've learned an amazing truth over the last few years. And, um, and that is that 95, and, and, and I've been looking back at our entire marriage, right? Um, and uh, 21 years, I mean, our marriage is old enough to drink. And it's almost driven my wife to drink. Um, and so, <laughs> but I've realized something. And I, I, I said, you know, I told my wife this. I said, I've realized that 95% of the problems in our marriage over 21 years have been because of me. And she's like, wow, and you haven't even factored in that there's a 5% margin of error. <laughs> Wait, what? I'm like, I just, got, I just got math burned, and I didn't even realize it. And... Uh, but that, so listen, if you, and the point is this, if you are the problem, don't be the problem. And the third is this, and that is that peace is a byproduct of knowing God. You see, this is a famous verse, right? And if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've, you've heard it, right? It's called the fruit of the spirit. Maybe we can put it up on the screen uh, that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These nine characteristics. And we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. When you walk up to a tree, uh, you know what kind of tree it is based on the fruit that it's producing. And that's the idea that the Bible is giving to us. And that is that if, if you're digging roots in, in, in this God life that you have, as you walk with Him, as, as you, uh, you know, grow in Him, this is the fruit that's going to be produced, that people are going to look, and, and these are the characteristics that are the markers of someone who knows God. And what that means is then that peace becomes for us like a gauge for us to be able to know how close we are to God. And if we're growing in peace, then we realize that our fruit is in full bloom. And if we have healthy roots that are growing in Him, this kind of fruit, this kind of peace is the natural byproduct of growing in Him. And that is for us what Jesus is saying is, listen, where there is peace, if there is peace, the more that you grow in him, the more that you have peace, here's what you're going to find. You are going to have more joy and you're going to have, you're going to be happier because no matter what, that peace doesn't have to be something external. It can be something that's lived from the inside out. And now he talks about peace because He's going to transition now to conflict. And look at what he says in verse 10. He says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Last thing, um, if you're a note taker, and that is that happy people aren't influenced by haters. They're not influenced by haters. And here's, and I want you to notice three things that are important here, right? And, and this is just maybe write them in the margin or somewhere. Jesus is making in verse 10 a general statement about um, be, people who are persecuted for doing the right thing. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is a general statement. And verses 11 and 12, he gets very specific. And that's the second thing I want you to note. He says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say kind of all evil against you. Great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now it gets very personal. He says you five times. And that brings me to the third thing I want you to notice. And that is that the persecution for righteousness sake, that is the reason for the persecution where there is reward. That it's a difficulty, a challenge, trouble that arises for being a follower of Jesus. G uh, Peter, the disciple of Jesus, expounds on this point. Here's what he says. Uh, it's in your notes. He says, if you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it, mu it, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. The blessing comes if we suffer for being a Christian. There is no blessing that comes for suffering from being a knucklehead. And that is an important thing to understand uh, because when we say, well, I'm doing the right thing and, uh, and someone is, uh, I'm feeling this, this is because of my faith. Well, Jesus is saying there's a blessing that comes associated with that. But sometimes, listen, sometimes we do dumb things. And then there are the consequences of the actions of doing dumb things. Um, so our, this is a while back, but our, our family, um, we went to go see Black Panther the day it came out. We bought tickets early, and then we were very excited to see it. Now, here's the challenge that I have. You know, I've been trying to eat healthy over the last year. And so most, I don't know if you've been to a movie theater or tried to eat there lately, um, but there's... It's, it's, you know, fried carbs, basically, is all they serve in, in its various forms. So I'm, I'm now, you know, I, I have kind of a situation every time I go to the movie theater, like, what am I going to eat? And it was a lunchtime. It was like a 12-10 show. So it's lunchtime, and uh, so the movie theater food doesn't jive well with my eating habits. So what I have to do, I, I have to resort to kind of smuggling healthy food into the theater. So I packaged up some almonds. Um, and I put that in my back pocket, and then um, I had to, I had a salad that I had to smuggle in, and I, I really would not like to talk about how I had to smuggle that in, because I feel like it'll make this conversation awkward. So anyway, I, I uh, but I had the, I had the um, salad in this container, and then I had um, a, another smaller container with some Caesar dressing, and then I went to the theater and I bought a bottle of water just because I like to keep it real between me and the theater. I'm like, hey, I'll just have that $17 bottle, $17 bottle of water because that just, that seems normal. Um, and so, anything else? No, I had to sell my car to buy that bottle of water, so I'll just take that. Um, so anyway, so we get, now, the way it works is we get to the, the, we walk into the theater and the lights are already out because they're showing, I think, the last trailer before the movie starts. And I mean, this is a very anticipated movie. And we're all excited to see it. So as the movie is getting started, I get out my lunch. And I open up the container. I get the salad. I bring utensils. And I have them kind of wrapped in a napkin because I'm not a total animal. I'm trying to, you know. So anyway, so I get the dressing out. I pour the dressing in, uh, out, put the container back on, put it in my little um, cup holder. And then um, Pastor George actually taught me this. And he, he'll testify uh, see, he's, he's testifying already. I don't even know what I'm going to say, but he's testifying. Um, it's like you've heard this message twice before already. Um, anyway, so what happens is, is that um, part of the key to a salad is to make sure you get the equal amount of dressing on every piece of lettuce. This is the goal of all salads. And uh, so what you have to do is, and this is what George taught me, 
is that what you do is you put that uh, you put all the lettuce in in the container you put the dressing and then you put the, you put the lid back on and then you shake it violently so that all of it works so you know the movie starting you know marvel studios presents and i'm like and then i start shaking the salad and it sounds like i have a bag of rocks but <laughs> To the point where people, I just, you know, I got this big guy next to me, and he's, he's looking at me, and I'm like, wow, we're going to be close friends for the next two hours. And uh, he doesn't like me. A couple people are yelling at me. A couple people said some words I can't repeat at church. And um, anyway, and so now, I'm, so I stopped shaking it. I'm like, well, at least that's over. And then I open the container very carefully because I don't want anybody to get upset. And now the movie has started. Grab my fork. Take a quick sip of water. Get my fork out and I'm watching. Now, I don't know, you don't even realize this because you go to a restaurant and people are talking. You have no idea how loud lettuce is, <laughs> especially those of the Romaine family. So I take a bite and it is, I mean, pin. I mean, it sounded like a 747 was landing in the theater. I was chewing so loud, I couldn't even hear the movie. And the guy next to me is like, seriously? And I'm like, what? I can't hear you. And uh, needless to say, so I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine someone walks up to me in the middle of the movie. This didn't happen. I know some of you are like, oh, no, this didn't happen. I'm saying, what if? This is pretend, okay? I'm just making sure I'm signaling here, all right? Sometimes I'm, I'm sarcastic with my daughter, Livy, and she doesn't get it, so I do this. So this is to signal that I'm joking, okay? So let me just do this for all you guys, all right? So imagine, imagine someone walks up to me, grabs my container, and begins to beat me with it, all right? Now, I cannot claim Christian persecution. That would be hashtag theater justice. That's what that, right? Like, you got to stop with the chewing. And this is the point. And, that, and this is the point, the truth that we miss in the church today, because so often, listen, um, in, in churches all over the country, listen, and, 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 and this is not me trying to be critical. This is just what I've observed, is that we get fed this message. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be okay. You're never going to have any problems if you walk with Jesus. The problem is Jesus never said that. Here's what Jesus said. It's possible you're going to be persecuted for doing the right thing. It's possible that because of your faith, people might discriminate against you. You might get passed over for a promotion. There might be people who hate you because you're a follower of Jesus. And you know what that's going to remind you of? That, listen, the outside persecution is going to remind you that you're doing the right thing. And when you're doing the right thing, you're going to know that God is with you. And that's going to bring joy into your life. Because, listen, you only feel resistance when you're swimming upstream. So at work, there might be some difficult times. There might be times you get excluded because you're not going to play the reindeer games because of your faith. There might be moments where... You become a Christian and members of your family will attack you um, or exclude you. And can I tell you this, that that was my story? That I became a Christian, my, my older brother led me to Jesus, and then my wife and I, we were just dating at the time, we got off an airplane and I was carrying a Bible that my brother had given me. And in the airport, when I got off the plane, the attack, why are you reading that? What is that? What's, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to prove? Well, you're better than the rest of us. And I'm like, I'm just carrying a Bible. I haven't even said a word. Um, and, and, and all of that began. And you know what happened? And, so, and I remember calling my brother. I'm like, what in the world just happened? I, I, I didn't even know what I walked into. And he read me this passage. And he says, and if this is what's happening, then everything is going according to plan. God wants to use your life. God wants to transform your life and the life of everyone around you, and he wants to use you to do it. And don't think that the enemy of your soul is happy about it. And here was the crazy part, is that the attacks that I got as a young Christian drove me 
to seek God more, to read the Bible more, to read books that help me to learn how to defend my faith more. And the thing that the enemy was doing to bury me turned out to be the thing that God used to strengthen me, to clarify my calling, to teach others everything that I had learned. And I want to tell you something that the very same thing is true for you. You're going to, in the moment, it doesn't feel good. And the Bible tells us that, that in the moment, the test doesn't feel good. But you're going to look back after you've come through the difficulty and realize that those were the things that strengthened you, that those were the moments that developed you. Those were the things that God used to transform your life. And when you look at those moments, you will say, man, I was blessed. I didn't realize that it hurt, but I was blessed because those are the things that deepened my faith and those are the things that cemented my trust and now I feel like I can handle so much more whatever life brings because that relationship that walk that commitment has been totally settled let's pray together and Lord we want to thank you thank you that you are with us no matter what that we have a promise from you that you will never leave us that you will never forsake us so thank you for that help us to be the people that have the most joy that we are the happiest people on this planet because we know you, because you're with us, because instead of looking for circumstances to bring joy into us, God, we can have joy internally and live our lives from the inside out. So we thank you for that, for being with us. We pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you decided to take your next step with God and follow Jesus, please visit mycalvary.com forward slash begin. We have a free gift we'd love to give you. Also, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and also hit the subscribe button down below. From all of us here at Calvary, God bless you.